Mm. Where did we get to yesterday afternoon? <laughs> 58. Oh, we spoke about you know that you're you know that you're at the top when <laughs> nothing shakes you. So <laughs> not you know, you've reached the top. If you reach the top, you're in a very precarious position. You have reached centre. Okay. You know you're a stitha pragya yogi. So Krishna is starting to elaborate in response to Arjuna's inquiry. How do I know somebody who is truly established? How can I recognize? In other words, how do I know if I'm established? So Krishna starts to respond to this question. And Arjuna said, how does that person speak? What are that person's characteristics? What's their body language like? And what does Krishna talk about? He doesn't talk about their speech or how they sit or stand. He talks about them being steady and centered, basically. And we get all these synonyms. Samadhista, established in Samadhi. Buddhi yukta, connected, integrated. So that my buddhi, the subtlest part of my awareness, can serve me most easily. Yeah? Angela, do you have the text? I've got spare ones. Does anybody else need one? So there's the text. And here's a touch for the sheet. Very she sheeny paper this time. Thank you. So Krishna talks about basically being centered, yes? And he talks about when then. So we have this construction that we see in several verses. When you're like this, then you can be like that. So what are some of the things he says? When you are how? What does Krishna say? When you hear things that previously confused you, when you are exposed to ideas, arguments that previously confounded you, but instead of feeling confounded, you are even, this is one of the hallmarks. Yes? What's another one? Yes. So when you're not so, when things come as you might like them, or things come different from how you might like them, you're still able to be even and steady. Yeah? So he talks about how when you are in that state, you'll still experience difficult times, you'll still experience agreeable times, but you won't get kind of overly lifted up, heading for a crash you won't get overly dejected. So we talked about this idea, you'll still experience the whole spectrum of life, but it won't play you. You will be able to enjoy all the different experiences, the challenging times, you'll be able to stay steady, you'll feel them, but they won't destroy you. They won't ravage your center. Yeah? Any other key ideas from yesterday? said when you can go beyond all of your desires and you no longer see things with rose tinted glasses, then you know that you're centered. Or yes, so we had this, Krishna talked about being vita raga baya kroda, being free from raga, which means seeing things through that tint, being free from also being hateful towards things, being free from those limiting fears and being free from getting consumed by anger. You may still feel anger, but it won't overtake you. You won't become angry kind of thing. Yeah? We got a little ho homework task, yeah, or homework suggestion. Mm -hmm. What was that? That was related to the 56th verse, yeah? What were the five suggestions for inquiry? What do I attach to you? A bit louder, Anne? What do I attach to? And what do I fear? What do I get angry about? Yes. And are there things I can do to make myself less susceptible to that? Yep. Yeah. So what Anna has just done is what Arjuna does when 
he poses the question to Krishna in the 53rd verse. He phrases it in a slightly different language. So for our inquiry, we took the 56th Sutra. Let's just have a glance at 56 together. So we've got Dukkeshu Anudvignamanaha. Dukkeshu, in difficulties, the established one, their clarity of awareness is not shaken. So then we put the question to ourselves. What type of situation do I find difficult or disturbing to the degree that it clouds or shakes the clarity of my awareness? Sukeshu vigatas prihaha. So the established one in pleasing situations does not get kind of consumed with the desire for more. So we, got, we could turn that into an inquiry question. What type of pleasant situation makes me hanker for more in a way that plays on my awareness and stops me seeing clearly? Yeah? And then he said, Vita Raga Vyakrodaha. So the established one is free from Raga, seeing things through that tint, Baya, and fear, and Kroda anger. So we had the questions What do I tend to see in a not so impartial way? What do I feel, like Anna said, what do I feel so attached to I can't see it clearly? Bhaya. Are there aspects or areas in my life where my fear of potential outcomes is stopping me do the action that actually I want to do in the moment? And then Kroda, what things don't just make me feel anger, but what type of situation can anger get a grip on me in? Yeah? Did you, did anybody do this exercise? Yes. Yes? Was it revelatory? <laughs> yeah. Useful? Yeah, it was for me as well. Now, one of my teachers says, you know, every verse is a meditation. So every verse, we can do this type of thing with it. You know, sometimes people say, oh, I read the Bhagavad Gita. <laughs> when somebody talks about the Yoga Sutra, the Bhagavad Gita, like that, it just shows that they haven't got what the text is about. Because the text is a, it's a support for ongoing inquiry. It's not designed to be read and then passed on to your friend because you've already read the story. The idea is it's worth looking into many, many times. Even Mahabharata, the great epic, yeah? I've read several versions of Mahabharata and I keep reading it. I just, it's just so fascinating. There's so much about life, about now. It's these mirror texts. Every time you look into them, they show you something new. But any verse, we can take it and you know, just shift it and make it a, a lens for inquiry. So that's one way to read the text, to study the text. I take a verse and I ask myself a question related to it. What does it show me? This is, this is starting to work with the text in the more traditional way. So if we had more time, for example, that's why to it. This is something that we could take some time to then do this in a dyad or a triad. And we could do exercises just like where we set things up so one person doesn't know. We, we, we make our own inquiry questions and then we share them with somebody else, for example. So there's more practical things we can do around. So this is the more practical learning thing we could do in this class time. Now today we've got another 15 verses that I'm <laughs> committed to get through. So we won't do that. But if you did start that exercise, or if you didn't, we can repeat it. Or I can say, ah, I can add a second question. So for example, if I notice that there is a certain thing, then I can say, well, what could I do about it? What would Krishna suggest I might do about it? And then I could try and notice if it makes a difference over the next week or month or whatever. Yeah? And then Krishna said in the 57th, the person who's always and everywhere. Well, one thing, one more thing that was important, he said, Atmani Eva Atmana. Remember that phrase? Krishna, that as soon as he began his reply, he said, the established one is Tushtaha, contented, happy in and of himself, or by Atmani Eva Atmana, in him or herself, with him or herself, by him or herself. As you become the locus and the cause of your own fulfillment. 
you're no longer dependent on these external things for your sense of self, for your sense of well-being, for your sense of wholeness. And so, again and again, the directive is we practice fullness as best as we possibly can. Yeah? Samatva. We gather all the parts, like we, did, we made the, the, the effort in that direction this morning. Shall we continue? So, 58. Yada samharati chayam together. Yada samharati chayam kurmun gani vasarvashah. Kurmun gani vasarvashah. Indriyan indriyarte bhyaham. Indriyan indriyarte bhyaham. Tasya pragnya pratishtitam. Tasya pragnya pratishtitam. So this is a, there's a few really spectacular verses in this final section, and this, in my opinion, is one of them. Yada tada, we have again. When, then. So when yada, when, I am. Ch chaya means and this one. I am this person, this established person. Kurma. What is kurma? Some of you practice kurmasana, I imagine. You maybe just did it, Steve? Yeah. Did you do full primary or? Yeah, yeah you did kurmasana. What's kurma? Tortoise. The tortoise or the turtle, yeah? So, and we've got angani. Kurmangani, yeah? so this, you've got like the apostrophe there, it's angani. What are angani? You just practiced a form that they call it anga, ashta anga. Angani. Limbs. Angani is the plural of limbs. So you've got kurma, limbs, and iva. Iva means like or as. Sarvashaha. Remember, remember the word sarva? Sarva means all, yeah? Sarvashaha, all around. So when this person who is established, samharati. Now remember this morning we sang to hari, yeah? What do we say Hari meant? Takes away our blocks, yeah? Remove. So Hari is to take away. Samharati, to bring in, to draw in. So in Sanskrit this happens a lot. A verb, it can be shifted by the prefix or some additional, or sometimes two prefix. So Har, remove, take away. Ahar, bring towards. Pratyahara, back towards the source. Samharate to draw in well. So Krishna says, when that stitta pragya yogin, when the established person draws in his or her limbs on all sides like a tortoise, draws them in well, <coughs> the indriyani in relation to the objects of their of the indriyas. So when a person draws in his or her limbs. In, sorry, when a person draws in his or her sense and action powers in relation to their objects, like a tortoise draws in its limbs, then that person's pragya, discriminating wisdom, is said to be well established. Is that clear? I kind of mumbled it up a bit, yeah? When the person, when you as a human being, the established one, draws in or turns their action powers and their sense powers back inwards from the external objects back towards the source just as a tortoise draws in its limbs then that person is said to be well established so in other words be like the tortoise when does the tortoise draw in its limbs so to say that to recast that in a slightly different language when it's for its own good, yeah? <coughs> to help it stay alive. The, the kurma, the tortoise is a very special creature in the Indian system. Krishna, or Vishnu, Narayan, in one of his previous incarnations was a kurma, the kurma avatar, the second avatar of Vishnu. The first was a fish, second one was the tortoise. 
I, I would like to go into a big digression about the ten avatars of Vishnu, but we don't have time today. Again, this is something we could do, yeah? But the kurma, why is the kurma so celebrated? Did they talk about the tortoise when you did your course in India at all? No. no? So sometimes people do, and they talk about that. Why is the tortoise so special? Why is it so championed in yogic law? What's the tortoise famous for? Okay, in, in India, what's the tortoise famous for? And here it may be famous for moving slowly, but what's the tortoise famous for in India? This is the... But the tortoise lives a long time, yeah? It's one of the longest living animals. So, one of my friends went to a quite well-known yoga teacher in Mysore one time and this my friend was not perhaps the most receptive to this teacher's methods but in the initial meeting the man said to him in yoga breath very important breathe like tortoise long slow tortoise live long life don't breathe like dog. Ha <laughs> ha Dog lives short life. <laughs> and my friend was like, is that the best he can offer? And he didn't go back to him. But I know another man from, uh, he's from Sweden or often. And he, he spent a lot of time with this teacher. And in his teaching, there's a great emphasis on what people refer to as pranayama. Extending the life force. Breathing less and less and letting the breath be refined and subtle. So the tortoise takes few breaths a minute. They say in yoga, when without forcing it, you reduce the tempo of your breath, and your breath becomes easier, then it's like night following day, your awareness becomes clearer. Because the breath being in that very relaxed, steady tempo gives you spaciousness. That makes sense. But we can't aggressively decelerate the breath. We have to invite it. Again, this is a big topic that I would like to elaborate on in great depth, but we don't have time for it. But how did we breathe in our practice in the body yesterday and today? Freely. There was no there was no directive. We invited the breath to be relaxed. Did anybody get out of breath? We did some quite dynamic things, but nobody got out of breath at all. Because we invite the breath to be easy. So, this is the real intention of a lot of pranayama techniques, is to invite the system to remember how easily it can breathe. Like many things in modern Hatha Yoga, there's been some, con some confusion has emerged as people approach these techniques with a Western no pain, no gain attitude. But the idea is we want to invite our awareness to be like the awareness of the tortoise, who is slow and steady, who takes a little bit of time. Now you know the story of the tortoise and the hare? Yes? You know the yogic version? So there's the race, yes? And tortoise and hair. And how does hair feel at the beginning of the race? <laughs> Got this in the bag. And hair blazes off into the dusty distance and tortoise can't even see the hair after only a few seconds. And the, the hair is rather cocky, yes? It's a hot day. The hare arrives, he sees by the wayside a nice shady tree. He thinks, ah, oh, time for a medis siesta. And the hare reclines against the tree and it's been very hot, he's been racing, galloping along, and he goes into slumber. And in his slumber he is visited by dreams. And in his dreams, what rises to the surface of his dreaming awareness? Some of those latent desires. And what is young hair interested in? Carrots. No. <laughs> 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 he 
Young hair is interested in young lady hair. <laughs> and his dream is full of a young lady hair, a particular young lady hair. He opens his eyes and who does he see before him? His dream made manifest. <gasps> wow! And she says, what are you doing sleeping under a tree there? Boy, <laughs> tonight in Hairville, it's party time and we're waiting for you. Come on. And he's like, oh, wait a minute, so it's been a race. This is internal dialogue, yeah? Oh, yeah, but that tortoise is so slow. I've probably got a week's head start on him now. Yeah, come on. And off, she, and she, he follows her. And anyway, I'll ask, you can elaborate the story, but they have a final time for a while, but it turns out that lady here, she's a trickster. She drugs him, she steals him, she steals from him. And because she drugged him, he was in a, like almost like a coma-like stupor for a long time. When he comes back to his senses, he re oh, I'm supposed to be in a race. Now, when he was following beautiful young lady here, he didn't pay much attention to the way because he was looking at the way she moved so gracefully. So he thought, how oh, do I get back? Anyway, he eventually gets back on the track. But what does he see on the track? Tortoise footprints. And he bounds off, and he bounds off. And he sees the finish line ahead. And he sees the tortoise, and frantically tries to catch up, but it's too late. So the moral of the story is... <laughs> so in these stories, we have to penetrate beneath the surface. <laughs> yeah? So the moral of the story is, slow and steady wins the race. But also, if we get overexcited, it can be easy to go off down one of these branches. Remember that what Krishna said, Bahu Shaka Hyanantas Cha. The ways our energy can leak out, they're endless. So the hair is not Vyavasaya, what Krishna was talking about in verses 41 to 44. He's not Vipashchita. Vipashchita, remember to be inspired. Now the tortoise is inspired. It might not look like it from Hare's perspective, because Hare sees the tortoise, to his eyes, lumbering along. But the tortoise is moving steadily, surely, and is resolute on his intended direction. And the tortoise gets there. The Hare doesn't get there. Because he was drifted up, yes. You can, you can tell us, you can end the story, the hare never finds the way back to the race course, if you like, but... Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So the idea is, let us be like a tortoise. In the sense, don't go bounding off before you're clear about, well, why am I doing what I'm doing? Yeah? So as the tortoise moves with purpose. So better to be slow and purposeful than careen into action when we might waste a lot of energy. Has anybody ever done that? I've done this many times. Like, I see a challenge or I see a situation, I just kind of like, don't see a very easy way forward, then I start doing one that expends a lot of energy. Only to realize later, there's a much easier way. There's a funny story about that. Like, I was in Kashmir one time, and a big ceremony. And during the three days of ceremony, we have lunch on the lawn. And the dining table are these beautiful, light-colored, natural-colored woolen blankets. 20-meter-long blanket, white, cream-colored. And you sit on the ground, and there at the table is the woolen blanket. The metal vessel is put on the table, and the people come round serving. What do they serve? It is Indian. Rice and dal. What's one of the main spice ingredients in dal, beginning with tea? Yes. Turmeric. And they dollop it onto your metal plate from some height. <laughs> what does the white and cream colored wool look like by the third day? It has the turmeric infused look. At the end of the festivities, it's cleanup day. Now the first year I go to Kashmir, I'm assigned this task. And that year there'd been a curfew. 
and some trouble in the valley, and so not many young people had gone. And me and the other young man assigned to it, neither of us had done it before. So we spent the whole morning doing animal locomotion exercises up and down the 20 meter wall, scrubbing and scrubbing and scrubbing, and expending so much energy. At the end of the day, we felt pleased with ourselves because we made such an effort, such a you know, stalwart effort, all day long we've been scrubbing. And next year I go. There's also been some trouble in the valley. Not many people come to the gathering relative to normal. That meant in the preparations for the festivities, I got to do a lot of really beautiful jobs that normally only the elder ladies get, ladies get to do. So I feel very blessed to do all these special jobs. But what's in the back of my mind, because I'm not a Stitta Pragya Yogi and I'm not fully absorbed in the present moment, what is also in my mind. I'm a bit worried about the clean-up day, I might have to do that by myself. Clean-up day comes, and it just so happens that that year, two boys who grew up in the valley are there. And they are assigned to this task with me. We're walking over to the area to do it. And I'm like, oh, it's going to be a tough day then, yeah? What do, you, what do you mean? So I did this last year. They weren't there that last year. Who did you do it with? Raju. Ah, oh, Raju the video guy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he hadn't been before, had he? I, I, before either, had he? No. So you're both here for the first time, yeah? Yeah. So what did you do? <laughs> so we used a lot of energy. And the Kashmiri guy's like, I think you wasted a lot of energy. <laughs> so, so how did you do it? And I told him, he's like, no, 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 come. And the two of them, because all your equipment, your equipment is a little bit of wood like this to scrape and a sachet, one little sachet of laundry detergent, and that's it. And there's a well here. So they set themselves up, and then you've got a path, you can lay the, the blankets on. So they set themselves up on two little wooden stools facing each other in the dappled sunlight. They get the well going, they get a hose and so they've got a constant water supply and they fold the blankets and then they start, they're just chatting and they're doing this between them and gently folding it. So basically every layer is getting washed 20 times but they're not, they just sat down chatting and it comes out like, you know, like on a detergent advert <laughs> but they didn't have to grunt and sweat. And they said, at the end of the day, they said, so James, yeah, last year you said you used a lot of energy. No, you wasted a lot of energy. Because I was like a hare. I was like excited, okay, I'm going to scrub. Yeah? So yoga says, no, bala is, sorry, kala, artfulness, is greater than bala, physical strength. The tortoise, when does it draw in its limbs? When there is artfulness to it. It doesn't draw in its limbs when it's not necessary. It draws it in when it wants to rest when it wants to protect itself, when it wants to keep cool, when there is a purpose. So Krishna is not saying here, the practitioner or the established one turns away from the objects of life, the objects of the senses. No. Krishna says the established one interacts with the world, but takes the sense powers back in even as they engage with the objects. So I'm relishing the lovely food, but I'm observing myself relishing the food. And this is pratyahara. I can enjoy the experience, but I can notice myself enjoying it. And the noticing, the relish of that, is sweet in all types of external stimulus. And so I start to become less attached to the externals and more connected to the richness of deep presence. Yeah? So going on to 59, Krishna further kind of continues this thread. Vishaya vinivartanti Vishaya vinivartanti nirarasya Nirarasya rina Rasavarjam rasopyasya Rasavarjam rasopyasya 
ಪರಂದೃಷ್ಟ್ವಾತೆ ಪರಂದೃಷ್ಟ್ವಾತೆ ಸೊ ಇಸ್ ಕಂಟಿನ್ಯೂ ದಿಸ್ ಸೈಮ್ ಐಡಿಯಾ ವಿಷಯ ಮೀನ್ಸ್ ಆಬ್ಜೆಕ್ಟ್ಸ್ ಸ್ಪೆಸಿಫಿಕ್ಲಿ ದಿ ಆಬ್ಜೆಕ್ಟ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಎಕ್ಸ್ಪೀರಿಯನ್ಸ್ ದಿ ವಿ ಎಕ್ಸ್ಪೀರಿಯನ್ಸ್ ಥ್ರೂ ಅವರ್ ಸೆನ್ಸ್ ಪವರ್ಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ದಟ್ ವಿ ಇಂಟರಾಕ್ಟ್ ವಿತ್ ಥ್ರೂ ಅವರ್ ಎಕ್ಸ್ಪ್ರೆಸಿವ್ ಆಕ್ಷನ್ ಪವರ್ಸ್ ವಿನಿವಾರ್ತಂತೆ ವಾರ್ತ್ means to live or to, to, to turn to rotate so vini vartante means to turn back away from to turn away from dehinaha deha in sanskrit means body dehin means that which has but which is in the body so it means the embodied soul the soul but when it's in an embodied form niraharasya Now, does anybody know what nirahara means? It means when you've given up food. So it says basically here that the objects of the senses, they will turn away from the embodied soul who has given up food. Is this true? Have you ever felt like, oh, I really want to have a particular visual experience? Or, I really want to have a particular auditory or tactile experience? Yeah? What happens if you don't eat for a few days? Do you want to go to the movies? Do you want to have uh, a massage? What do you want? You want some food? <laughs> yeah. The idea is, if you starve yourself, the energy to engage with the objects will diminish yeah so some people there are some types of practitioner who do these things that some of these people call austerities and then the the impulse to move towards the flavors of life diminishes somewhat because you have less energy for them the inclination is kind of suppressed but does it go away does it die no it just goes into dormancy rasa varjam except for taste because it's so connected to the survival of your physical being you can suppress to great degree inclinations for many of the sense experiences but the suppression of your appetite for prana for food and water and all the things that give you physical energy you cannot suppress that to the same degree as the others because the day if the if the deha is to st- is to stay a dehin an animated body it needs that nourishment yeah so krishna says the sense objects it's like they will turn away from a person who turns away from them so if you practice renunciation if you turn away from the world it's likely that your appetite for worldly things will diminish like appetite grows by what it feeds on yeah if if i make a habit of every day watching things on a screen it might become something that i have a develop an appetite for but if i live in a screenless place i might find that not particularly appealing yes has anybody had a chance recently to live without a screen for some time for a long like a How does it feel after a while? And do you want it? No. No, you kind of feel ah, oh, yeah, I'm quite happy without that. So in these types of things we can wean ourselves off them relatively easily. But when it comes to food and drink and air, no, the system will have a, will call out for them in a much more persistent way. Yeah? But Krishna says, rasa api asya parandrishtva nivartate. He says When you have drishtva which means seen experienced param param means the ultimate the supreme totality even that will turn away from you is it once you've really had the full experience and this is what we mentioned yesterday when you have the full experience you're no longer attached to your body because the deha the vehicle of the body has conveyed the dehin the indwelling atman the indwelling soul to the destination it's been longing for 
Does that make sense? So you're no longer attached to the vehicle. The vessel has already carried the soul where it, all of those longings were, in, were really pointing to this sensation of wholeness. Why do we want anything that we want? Why do we want to watch the movie or look at the beautiful sunset or painting or hold our friend's hand, whatever it might be? To feel connected, to feel better, yeah? to feel fuller, wholer, richer, sweeter. But if you feel completely full, completely whole, completely complete, then you don't need anything else. So again, Krishna is giving the whole spec. This is the top down. So he's describing the established yogi. Now, if I'm not established, how can I turn this descriptive verse into a prescriptive one? For example, when I engage with the world, can I do it in such a way that I let the engagement be the nourishment at least as much as, if not more than, the particular external. That makes sense? So I go to the cinema, for example, to watch a film, and rather than just mindlessly watch it and veg out, <laughs> as it were, I'm noticing myself being able to cognize this thing. So I create this tortoise-like spaciousness and I'm relishing myself having that visual experience, that, or that sensory experience. And so my sensory experience is helping me connect to my power supply, to my conscious essence. Yeah? When you go to the cinema, all the different images are flashing. So one practice you can do is like, you observe when it's changing. You notice the change. This makes the film not as fun, but, <laughs> but you, you're allowed, you do a practice to notice yourself noticing you. Yeah? So when I taste the water, as well as being thankful and relishing the water, I notice that I can notice myself tasting the water. It's like, this is Pratyahara, basically, these two verses. So not to shy away from the world, but when I do something with my hands, feet, voice with my sense powers to do it in such a way that I kind of take ownership of the experience and then the experience becomes another opportunity to deepen my capacity to be present and so I find the real joy is in the presence I bring to the situation rather than oh it's not as good as that film or it's not as nice as that meal yeah have you ever had a really, really good meal? Mm -hmm. Let's make it more simple. Um, have you ever had a really, really good um, fruit? What's, a, what's an example? Mm -hmm. Where was that? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, last week I was in Yorkshire and at my father's house, there is a green gauge tree. You know green gauges? Do you know green gauges, Patricia? The green gauge is one of those fruits that is far superior in the United Kingdom than in Spain. <laughs> Often it's the other way around, yeah? Like oranges. In Spain, you have amazing oranges, yes? In England, you can just about grow an orange tree, but yeah? Now, let's say you go to the place that is supposed to have the best oranges in the world. And you're going to meet the owner of the orange orchard. It's been an orange orchard for 3,000 years at least. And it's been looked after in the tra traditional way and they have the very best oranges. And you've been invited to a tasting at the perfect moment of ripeness. How will you eat the orange? <laughs> With a sense of wonder and presence, yeah? And how will the orange be? 
It'd be amazing, yeah. It would be like, wow. Now you might think, oh, well, now I've tasted that one. Then you go to the market in Glasgow, that's not an orange. <laughs> that attitude is shutting down life, yeah? This orange in the supermarket, maybe it won't quite be quite as having all the qualities of the one that's straight from the tree. But this is the orange that's available now. So one of my friends, uh, he lives in a place in the Pacific Northwest where salmon is like the very celebrated animal. And the wild salmon, they fish a lot at certain times of the year. And this man, this man and his father, since he was a boy, his father would take him fishing in that season. And people always say, oh, it's, it's so good, it's straight from the sea, so it's, it's the best one, and, this is and, there's very, and there's different varieties. The king salmon, the sockeye salmon, and the various ones. And people say which one they like best. And my friend's father said, the best one is the one you're eating. <laughs> What's your favorite? The one that I am actually able to eat. So whichever orange it is, as long as it's in, you know, a healthy orange, it's not gone bad, it's still relatively fresh, it still contains so much miraculous wonder. So if I allow myself to engage with it, but in a present way, <coughs> like the tortoise with purpose, this orange is not just giving me phytonutrients and vitamins and calories, this orange is a gateway to the infinite miraculous wonder. How will you eat it? You'll eat it in a way that helps you connect to that wonder and that infinity. Yes? Mm -hmm. So the idea is practice engaging. Don't need, don't need to turn away from the world, but engage with the world in that whole system present way. Yeah? But Krishna says, the fully established one, even anything to do with the senses, no longer bothers them. They cannot, they, they don't even need them, they're completely full. Very good. Shall we continue? Mm -hmm. There's more we can say about these verses, but there's always more. Yatato hyapi kontean, Yatato hyapi kontea, Purusha siyavi paschite, Purusha siyavi paschite, Indriyani pramatini, Indriyani pramatini, Aranti prasavamana. Aranti prasavam mana Tani saivani sanyam yam Tani saivani sanyam yam Yukta asita mat param Yukta asita mat param Vashihi asindriyani Vashihi asindriyani Tasya Pragnya Pradishtitan Tasya Pragnya Pradishtitan So here in the 60s, Pratan, uh, not Pratan, Krishna says Yatataha hi api Yatataha means a person who is making a yatna A person who is making a firm effort Api, even those who are strongly resolved who are committed to their purpose, who are making a real effort, like the Vyavasayas that Krishna has already encouraged us to be. He calls Arjuna here, Kunteya, and this refers to his mother. Arjuna, you who are the son of Kunti, Kunteya. So in other words, you who are human, you who have come out of your mother's womb. He says, as long as you're a human being, even if, Purushasya. Purushasya means of the conscious human being. Even for a conscious human being who is vipaschitaha, remember that word, who is inspired, and who is yatata, who is making a firm effort, even for such a person, conscious, inspired, resolved, committed, making that steady, diligent, assiduous effort, even for such a person, 
इंद्रियानि प्रमातंति प्रमातीनि हरंति प्रसबं मनः the manas the part of our awareness that connects our external experience to the internal awareness that can get carried away forced prasabam forcibly by the indriyas because the indriyas are pramatini they stir things up that is their very nature the sense and action powers have this stirring capacity is this true so that's just their nature so krishna says even for a yatata vipashtita purusha a conscious human being who is making that strong steadfast committed effort even for such a person the indriyas can forcibly carry off that person's manas how does this happen because the indriya are powers they are powerful powers and they're good at what they do and what do they do they help us experience yeah now they have great capacity the sense powers can give us a lot of useful guidance is this true so our job is to train them to refine them so that we can bring out their capacity to really help guide us towards that which is going to bring about the internal fullness the manas and the indriyaha or the indriyani they are said to have a job and that job is to help us find that place of utmost charm now what's the trick here can your ears find the place of utmost charm can your eyes can your skin can your locomotive power the idea is no they will do their very best the senses and the mind will try really hard to find a place that is satisfying so have you ever stopped to watch your mind and your thoughts what does it do it keeps playing stories and ponderings and projections and memories yeah is looking for a place it can rest but poor old mind amazing power tool but when can it find rest when can it find utmost charm when can any of the sense powers find utmost charm name of a beetle song mm 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 come together yeah when they come together that's the trick is that the mind by itself is never going to find that place where it will lay down happy and rest similarly with any of the sense powers the only way they will come to rest is when they all come together when they play as a team they're so much greater than the sum of their parts so our job as the trainer as the captain <laughs> as the coach as the whatever you want to call it our job is to train our team to work as a team to unify this gang to bring all the members of the group into cohesive togetherness so they can function in a mutually supported mutually commend complementary way here yeah? there's a caution in this verse a reminder even a wise person who was very committed who's been making a strong effort even such a person can find themselves all stirred up and pulled off course by the perturbing stirring up powers of the senses and so we come back to the primacy of pasha the first imperative verb in the text look we have to be alert we've seen many examples in history of a great person who falls yeah there are many examples of holy men in india <laughs> they do something nobody would expect they fall so the idea is this is why we've got to be alert and attentive that's why those inquiry questions are so useful are there some tendencies that could come out sideways or could explode if i don't actually tend to them when i bring all the powers into togetherness then it's like the healing power of cohesion in that reconciliation 
It's like I give the opportunity for all the members to experience and relish the fullness that is their innate capacity to contribute to. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And when I give them the opportunity to contribute to that, I forgive them. I forgive myself for the way I may have misused them in the past. There is this tremendous power of forgiveness when that happens. If I bring all the parts, I invite all the parts to contribute, participate in the fullness of the present moment, the healing impact of that can run so deep because every part knows it is acknowledged, it's included, it's validated, it's respected. And it feels, yes, I am contributing to this wonderful orchestral symphony. Does that make sense? So this is the idea of the primacy of samadhi and why the impression that samadhi makes runs so much deeper than all the external things. Because when I invite all the members to come together, that is the field of utmost charm. That is so far beyond what we can experience by tasting some external thing that comes and goes, or being identified with tasting some external thing that comes and goes. Is it clear? Now, Krishna said there's this innate troubling potential of the Indriya, of these powers that are resident within us. So, having mentioned that, what do you think he might do? He might tell us how to avoid them being a problem, yeah? So how to deal with this power tool. <coughs> if you want to use a power tool, you've got to train yourself to use it, yeah? Use it respectfully. Because power tools, they can save a lot of time, or they can cause an unpleasant thing to happen that actually sets us back or stops us completing the task. So Krishna says, Tani Sarvani Sanyamya Yukta Asita Matpara Vashehi Asya Indriyani Tasya Pragya Pradishtita So Tasya Pragya Pradishtita, that person's Pragya, that person's intuitive wisdom is well established. Which person? The person who is yukta, remember that word, yukta, mm -hmm. connected. Connected to what? Krishna introduces a kind of a new concept here, mat para, which basically means me as the highest. So, 58, 59, pratyahara, fifth of the potentially in eight limbs, yes? Here, he's introducing what? Ishwara Pranidhana, one of the key methods in the Patanjali and Yoga method. The yoga of consecration, of dedicating our actions to that which we consider the highest. So Krishna says, Tani Saravani, these, Tani means these, what's he talking about? The sense powers, the action powers and the objects that they will interface with interact with and could become perturbed or stirred up by. So Krishna says the person who is Sanyamya. What's the first of the Ashtanga? Yama. Yama. Yeah. Sanyama is beyond so you have in the Yoga Sutra you have eight Ashtanga Yoga and then you have Sanyama. The last three limbs, Trayame Katra Sanyamaha. When Dharna Dhyana Samadhi become one, then this brings about Sanyama. So Yam means to harness. Yoga is very practical, it recognizes we are energetic beings. So Yama Niyama are principles to help us harness our energy. One of the principles is Ishwara Pranidhana, which basically means to consecrate our actions by offering them to that which we consider the highest. Doing whatever we're doing as if it's an offering to the person or to the principle that we love and cherish and value the most. Yes? If we do whatever we are doing as an offering to that which we feel most gratitude towards, to that which we most want, most want to respect, how will we do that thing? To 
the best of our ability. And how will we do it to the best of our ability? By giving ourselves to it wholeheartedly, with full presence. Yeah? So Ishwara Pranidhana is a very practical support for wholehearted, whole system, purposeful, respectful engagement. Yeah? It's like a check, a reference to help me remember, am I doing this in the way I would really like to be doing it? And so here Krishna says, the action and sense powers, innate within them, there is the capacity to stir things up and sometimes in a good way and also in a troubling or disturbing way. They can forcibly carry off our awareness. It can make us come off the path that we really would like to be on. So less, rather than being that steady tortoise, we've become the hare. We've jumped off somehow because of this sensory stimulus. So Krishna says, the one whose wisdom, whose deep intuitive wisdom is well established, that person sits yukta, connected to me as the highest. In other words, that person dedicates their actions towards the ultimate. Tani Saravani, Sanyamya, having well harnessed, Sanyamya means having well harnessed, having well harnessed the powers of all the Indriya. Now if we're going to harness the powers of our sense and action powers, what does that mean? Practically. If you hear the word harness, what might you think of? A horse, yeah. What type of animal is a horse? Powerful, yeah? Horsepower, people talk about horsepower, yeah? How many horses under the bonnet of your new car, yeah? I'm not into cars, but some people talk like that, yeah? Horsepower, a powerful animal. Does anybody train horses? Let's imagine we do. Are they all the same? No. If you want to harness the power, so you've got six horses and a big chariot. You want to go on a long journey. Yeah? I'm not going to see it, but they, I have never watched this program, but they brought out a massive, lucrative, money-spinning money, make, money film version of some television serial, yeah? That the Americans all go, they all go crazy about, yeah? You know what I'm talking about? Downton Abbey, yeah? So, and they, they ride in a horse and carriage, yeah? If you go on that type of journey, you've got six horses and a big chariot, how do you need to have your horses? Yoked, connected, integrated. They need to work as a unit, as a team, yes? Will the horses work as a unit or a team automatically? Very unlikely, yeah. Because how are the horses? They're each unique beings. With different temperaments, proclivities, gifts, strengths and weaknesses. Is this true? Does that remind you of anything? Sense. Our sense powers, you know, we all have our strengths and weaknesses, even within one sense power. We might have some parts of it that are very practiced and reliable, other parts of it that can kind of trip us up, yeah? So the idea is like, if you want to be sanyamya, if you want to harness the power of your senses, the first thing you need to do, like when you get with the horse, how do you need to be? Present. You've got to meet that horse, yeah? You've got to let the horse know you're there. You've got to meet that horse with loving presence. So it knows you're there, and, and then you can start to create a relationship and understanding. The horse will only serve you once you start to develop that close relationship. Is this true? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a beautiful film, I've forgotten what it's called about the... You know those that they made the film with Robert Redford, The Horse Whisperer? Mm -hmm. They made also a documentary film about the, the real guy that was based on. I've forgotten his name, but it's a beautiful film. Yeah. You know what the film's called? Of the. So there is this film, I think that, I can't remember his name, but I did watch it once, well, beautiful. Um, and he, he works with horses, and you really see how it was, he has that presence, yeah? Same with our sense powers, our action powers. We need to respect them, we need to get to know them. So, look at the Tatla sheet, another inquiry exercise. Each of the Indriyana, 
maybe spend some time meeting it, checking in with it. We mentioned creativity the other day. Do I actually give rain? Do I give, do I give the chance to my creativity to run? If I want my indriyas to carry me through this journey, I have to let them run, I have to train them. I have to give them free rein, but with purpose. This is the lovely thing with the horse. Once you train it, it will rejoice in serving you because when the six run together, they'll have a blast. Just like the indriya. When they function together, they can enjoy more. So this is how we need to train them. We have to acknowledge them. We have to respect their individual needs, their individual tendencies. And once we've done that, then we can yoke their gifts into a collective powerhouse that supports the purpose or direction that we really want to move towards. Yes? And here, Krishna, is, as well as introducing this idea of sanyama, which means yoking all the powers of our awareness so we can harness them for the well-being of the whole, he introduces this idea of Ishwara Pranidhana, basically. You can connect to me as the highest. To me? Because he's Krishna. Yeah. So, in an abstract way, yeah? So, to consider to... But con consciousness, to the subtlest part of your awareness, the mystery, if you want to call it, yeah? That which you consider the highest. When we make our actions an offering, then they become infused with the flavor of the Supreme, yeah? When I do something as a deeply heartfelt offering, then it starts to have this lovely flavor to it, yeah? Have you ever had the lovely opportunity to be fed by somebody who's cooking is a complete offering of love. I, I know, a, like, dance food is really good. I, re I mean, like, this is not to say anything bad about dance food, because I praise Dan and Melissa's food to the skies. But I know somebody who's at another level. And there's this woman called Kate. And her dharma, her service is, is food. I do a retreat in Yorkshire, and she caters for it. People are orgasmic at the meals. <laughs> First time I did it, that like, was all these old ladies. And we were having a silent meal, and they were just in fits of rapturous laughter when they decided. It was just like, oh, her food is like it's something else. But no, I know this woman quite well now in her family. For her, it is just every single moment in the kitchen is just an expression of this deep, deep love. It's just a thing of incredible beauty. And her food has a nu nutritive quality that is just out of, this, out of this world. It's like you feel so nourished on her food. It makes sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, <laughs> when we do something in that way, and all our actions become infused with that quality, are we likely to be waylaid by some glittery thing on the side of the road? No, because we're already feeling that fullness. Yeah? So Krishna here is, is talked about how potentially troubling the senses are, but the senses also, and the sense powers and the action powers, these are, part, these are the vehicle, this is the power. So if we harness that power, it can protect us, it can guide us where we really need to go. So it's how we interact with them. Yeah? Clear? Yeah? Now, 62, 63, we have the whole story of human history in 64 syllables. <laughs> so, Krishna's got it covered, yeah? And then some. This is very impressive, but seriously, <coughs> let's look at 62, 63. Dhyayato vishayan pumsaha Dhyayato vishayan pumsaha Sangaste shupa jayate Sangaste shupa jayate Sangad sanjayate kamaha Sangad sanjayate kamaha Kama kroto vijayate Kama kruto vijayate 
Krodat Bhavati Sammohaham Krodat Bhavati Sammohaham Sammoha Smriti Vibramaham Sammoha Smriti Vibramaham Smriti Bramshad Buddhinasho Smriti Bramshad Buddhinasho Buddhinasha Pranashati Buddhi nasha pranashyati Ragadvesha vyukta istu Ragadvesha vyukta istu Vishayan indriya ischaran Vishayan indriya ischaran Atma vashayir vidhi atma Atma vashayir vidhi atma Prasada mati gachati Prasada Madi Gachati Prasadi Sarva Dukhkanam Prasadi Sarva Dukhkanam Ani Rasyopa Jayati Ani Rasyopa Jayati Prasanna Chita Sohyashu Prasanna Chita Sohyashu Buddhif Pariyavatishnati Buddhif Pariyavatishnati So coming to, back to 62-63 Dhyayataha Vishayan Pumsaha Pumsaha means a human being Vishayan, we've had this word a few times now Does anybody remember what it means? Uh, Vishaya means an object Objects of the senses, yeah? The things that we objectify, what we look upon. So, Pumsaha is the subject, the human being. Dhyayataha. What is Dhyana? Dhyana means to meditate, yeah? So, what we focus on, what happens? Sangaha Teshu Upajayati. Teshu, in those objects, the objects that we focus on, the objects that we concentrate on, in them, or with them, what grows? Attachment. Sangaha. Association with them. An attachment to them emerges. Upajayate, it's like it emerges, it's born, it originates, it comes up. So what a human, whatever a human being focuses on, that person tends to get kind of attached to those things. <coughs> Is this true? As we desire, so our life becomes, is the idea, yeah? Now, when attachment is born, when attachment emerges, does it come out of the womb alone? No, it comes in a litter, yes? Sangat, sanjayate, karmaha. So sangat, from sangha, from attachment, something else is also born, yes? Sanjayate, together with the attachment is born what? Karmaha. What is karma? Desire, yes? So remember that we have karma with a r is action. Karma with the long r is desire, yeah? So f with attachment, it's not born by itself. It gets born along with desire for the things you're attached to, the things you're focused on. Is this true? Mm -hmm. Now, is that the end of them? Is it just a pair of twins? No. Karmat, krodaha, abhijayati. As well as attachment, what else gets born? As well as desire. The fear of losing it. When there is the fear of losing the thing you desire, what does that bring? Anger, Anger yes. So kroda, yeah. Because when desire is frustrated, how do we feel? Angry, yeah. So we've got attachment, desire, and anger. Is that the end of it? No. Kroda bhavati sammoha. When anger is born, when anger emerges, what happens to our awareness? Sammohaha. It gets thoroughly confused and clouded. Is this true? Blind rage. Blind rage we talk about, yeah? The green mist, yes? It's like our, or the red cloud. It's like our awareness is clouded, shrouded, veiled. We get confused, we get deluded, we get blinkered, blinded, yes? Is that the end? No. Sammoha, smriti vibramaha. What is smriti? Smriti means memory. It's like we lose our memory in the sense that we forget the wisdom that we've already accrued. Is this true? 
when we get attached to something, we don't get what we want, anger emerges in that anger, we start to get deluded and we forget the lessons we've already learned. Is this true? Yes, can you relate to the feeling in my voice? <laughs> yes. And smriti, smriti, smriti brahmshad, buddhi nashaha. When we forget out the lessons we've learned, when we lose touch with the wisdom we've accrued, it's like our buddhi, our discerning awareness, our integ integrated clear awareness, is lost. Is this true? And when we lose our integrated balanced awareness, how are we? Pranashati, then we are utterly lost. We're, just, we're, we're devastated, as sometimes they say in India. We're thoroughly devastated, thoroughly lost. Is this true? In the sense that we can't see a clear way. We're lost. We've lost our moorings. We've lost our anchor. We've lost our centre. We've lost our compass. Is this true? Mm -hmm. Is it not a brilliant summary of the course of human history? Mm -hmm. Why we repeat mistakes? Why we see history repeating itself? Because we're attached to things being a certain way. Maybe we're attached to being things, things being different from the way the previous generation messed it up. But when we're attached, we lose sight with the good things the previous generation gave us, for example. So we have this whole chain. As a person orients their awareness, what they focus on gets stronger. We get attached to the things that we give a lot of attention to. From that attachment is born desire. With that desire comes anger. But anger doesn't come alone, it comes with this confusion, this clouding. This has the consequence of letting us lose connection with the things we already know. Forget ourselves. Have you ever forgotten yourself? Yes. And then that has the consequence of losing the connection to the buddhi. We're no longer yukta. We're no longer connected now. That green mist, that anger, that forgetting ourselves. It's like there's so much interference through the channels of our awareness. They can't serve us very well anymore. And then we are lost. It's like we have an internal compass, but now all an internal communication system, but now the channels are all filled with all this gunk, with all this interference. We're not at a frequency that's going to give us a sustainable good vibration and clear directive. We're lost. Is this true? Isn't it brilliant? 64 syllables, kaboom. <laughs> So, if this is just not, sorry, 8, 16, 30, yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so what's this, these 64 syllables alert us to? That's the attachment. So we, what to do about it, yeah? We're practical, yeah? So Krishna's pointed out a difficulty, what's he going to suggest? In other words, but what's he just <laughs> suggested? What's he just suggested? Yukta asi tamatpara. He's just said the sense powers have the capacity to stir you up. When do they stir you up? When you're attached to the outcomes. How do you avoid that? He just said, Yukta asi tamatpara. Focus on the Supreme. In other words, make your dhyayataha, make your dhyana the ultimate. Make your dhyana something beyond the comings and goings. So if you focus on yoga, if you focus on not, not a brand of yoga, not a style of yoga, not a yoga technique, but on gathering yourself into samatva, into buddhi yuktaha, then that's a sensible thing to deploy the powers of your awareness towards, because that will make you robust. Yes, Jen? Uh, what's the word you're saying when you focus your... Dhyana. So the J and... No, dhyay. Oh. D-H-Y. Oh, okay. Seventh okay. limb of the... So this is meditation. Okay. So what you make your center, this is the key. What do you orient your life around? If I orient my life around... Krishna's already said it, yeah? The material things or ideologies, I'm lost. He's already laid that all out. 41 to 44, that was his emphasis, yeah? If you get carried away caught up in an ideology or material uh, pursuits, you can guarantee that you, it's going to scupper you or you're going to get disappointed. He said, what you need to focus on is being yukta, gathering, including, reconciling. So, what's the method? Yukta asita matpara. Indriya, indriyani, 
put the focus of your powers on the supreme, on the ultimate, on the cohesion, on the oneness. Yes? Yes, Steve. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If you focus on the of the highest, then surely part of that like, is, is ideology and part of yeah. that is an impression of what you think it might be. And for me, that journey could involve getting attached to finding out what it is, discovering what it is, and therefore being angry and all the rest of it. Yeah. Was talking about because I don't know. So what's Christian talking about in terms of focusing? So I, I, what I'm understanding is that he's focusing on making the action its own reward. Ishwara Pranidhana is a technique to make the action its own reward. So when I make my action an offering, do I want anything in return? No. I just want to make it as enjoyable for the person or the thing I'm offering it to as possible. And so I make the action its own reward. So this is the thing so you about... you know what the thing is? To do the offering? No. You can just do the offering and... Yeah. Put all your... All your everything and, your senses and, and this is why it's not, it's not Krishna the blue god or the flute playing god. Yeah. If, if that resonates for you, then use that image of Krishna. Just like if Christ resonates for you, use Christ. Yeah. The cross. Where is the cross? The cross is the junction. The place of being yukta. Christ is buddhi yukta. It's the same symbology, different terminology. So for some people it works, some people it doesn't. But if it does, you can use any great master, real master, not a disciple, <laughs> the person who has recognized it. So the highest is the idea, it's the place of the center that's beyond the good and the bad beyond the comings and goings so remember Krishna's already spoken about the person who gives up the concern with the fruit and is in pure action can go beyond both good and bad yeah so I'm not concerned with I'm just making the action an offering how do I make the action an offering I offer all of myself. So if I'm going to do Ishwara Pranidhana, Ishwara is the leader, the enabler. In other words, Ishwara is the conscience that animates all of these powers. So the way I understand it, I hope this is helpful for our question, Steve, is like, it's not that I'm focusing on an idea as the highest. I'm focusing on a way of inviting all of myself, authentically, honestly, as best as I can, into a space that is gathering everything, including everything. So that attitude necessitates the invitation or cultivation of harmony. Because I cannot invite all the past unless I'm making an effort towards harmony and inclusion. So, I think this is why yoga is so powerful and so practical, because it cuts through the dogma. You can be a believer in a particular type of symbol, but yoga doesn't ask you to believe anything. It's about how you orient your energy. So orienting the energy towards that which is highest, towards that which is supreme, we could say towards that which is all-inclusive, towards that which reconciles, towards that which includes. Does that, that any help? Yeah, so the, the caterer I mentioned earlier, she's called Kate, or Katharina, that's how she cooks. And so her cooking is that offering. She doesn't even need to know who she's cooking for, she yeah. just cooks, yeah. and then offers that. Yes, yeah. now in her, I don't know, but I imagine she cooks for God. It's like my, my friend Ravi, who's a flute master, he got me my harmoniums and he knows I like to sing. Now Ravi's a musician and that's his discipline, that's his practice. And 
he's been raised in the Indian system and he's also his family they're devotees of Krishna and Ravi says most important thing so he, he teaches flute so anybody who teach, teaches flute to he tells them the most important thing if you want to play the flute is to love the flute and practice with love and when you practice how do you do it? play for God So he says to me, he says, like, the first thing, you need to love your voice, James. And when you sing by yourself, you sing for God. So you don't worry how you sound. You just do it as that offering. Now to sing for God, what does that mean? You might say, well, huh? for some people that, that word is very troublesome. Mm -hmm. But what I think of it is like, sing for that which is enabling you to sing. God is the enabler, it's the container. Shiva or Vishnu, the name both means that in which everything exists. It's the consciousness which is allowing you to have the experience. That's what I mean when I say sing for God. Do it for God. Do it for that which is allowing you to do it. Do it to say thank you for that which is giving you the opportunity. Are you responsible for having come into this birth? Did you do something to get born? How blessed we are to be alive. So do it to say thank you for that which allows you to have an experience. That God, that ultimate, that supreme. Does that make sense? So even if you're an atheist, to say thank you for this gift of life, do it for that, sing for that, cook for that. Is that, yeah? Is that coming back to doing everything you do to your best? Yeah. So just be... So it's another way. So. In Patanjali, what Patanjali does is he explains the yoga method and he says the yoga method is basically to do whatever you're doing with all of yourself <coughs> and it's a constant steady unbroken effort to be present, to be fully present and then he introduces this concept of Ishvara Pranidhana and he introduces it with a particle Va, Ishvara Pranidhana Va. And va means and or as well, in addition, optionally. So you don't need to have devotion to some idea of the Supreme to practice yoga. You can be a dyed in the wool atheist or scientist or whatever and still practice the yoga method because the yoga method means doing whatever you're doing to the best of your ability with all of yourself, sincerely. However, if you are an emotionally motivated person, if you are of devotional persuasion, then the bhava, the feeling of doing it for somebody or something you love, will make it much, much easier to do it that way. Yeah? Like, have you noticed how sometimes I've been around some, like, women in Asia who have this maternal quality that's so strong, and so when they cook for somebody, they cannot help themselves. I have experienced it in South Italy as well. You go into someone's house, they cannot help. It overflows, this love just overflows, this generosity overflows. So for a person who has that feeling, or a person who doesn't quite have that feeling, let's say, but if you have the motivation, oh, I want to make it an offering, then it makes it much easier for us to come into the present fully. Yeah? It's like, say for example, um, let's say you're a dancer. Let's say you're a professional ballet dancer. You could take the example of Sergei Polonin, yeah? He had this, when he was young, he had a teacher in the sticks, his first teacher. And then he moved to, I can't remember if it was Moscow or wherever it was, or Kiev. When he, when, and his, his first teacher, she lives in the sticks, yeah? But if his first teacher comes to watch him perform, how will he want to do it? Because his whole career is because of her and his parents. So yeah, he went to study with the top people in whichever, whichever one he went to, in Moscow or Kiev, I can't remember. But the first teacher sacrificed and gave him so much. When she comes and makes the big journey to the performance, or if he goes to the place he grew up and performs, how will he perform? 
with extra care, with extra presence, with extra devotion, yes? There will be more love there, and how will it be? Everybody will be able to taste that, even if they're not aware of it, there will be a flavor that impregnates the action. So this is the idea of Ishwara Pranidhana. And doing what you're doing, focusing on me as the highest. Krishna means, literally means the black. It's the mystery. That which is allowing life. Let your life be an offering to that which is enabling you. It's funny how the God that is so problematic with human people. Like you're saying all the same stuff that you said about the sun. Yeah. And I was like, yes. Sun, yes. Well, no, Krishna. <laughs> and I don't know why, I find it really difficult, the God thing. But it's the same information, the package is different. And yeah. made some this amazing, great love it. But Krishna got him with that here. So the way I understand... It's yeah, it's, it's just to... And Krishna's a human being, so he can say all these teachings. A human being that came out and skipped around the rain and held up a mountain the story. Killed a thousand armies and rescued sixteen thousand cowards and slept them all. And he's blue. And he's blue. <laughs> 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 but that's why I don't know that it's really like. <clears throat> so, when we read scripture, scripture is poetry. Whose woods these are? I think I know. His house is in the village, though. He will not see me stopping here to watch his woods fill up with snow. My little horse must think it queer to stop without a farmhouse near between the woods and the frozen lake the darkest evening of the year. He gives his harness bells a shake to ask if there is some mistake. The only other sounds the sweep of easy wind and downy flake. The woods are lovely, dark and deep. But I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep and miles to go before I sleep. Do you know this poem? What's it about? <laughs> What's it really about? It's about death, yeah? So I went to the darkest time of the year. The woods are lovely dark and deep. I'd like to die, I'd like to go into that release, but I've got promises to keep. It's not about the woods. It's not about the snow, it's not about winter. <laughs> it's about death and the allure of death when life is difficult. Yeah? So this is, that's Krishna as a human. It's an archetypal human. But because he was a human, he was able to give us teaching. Now the teachings get, the stories get elaborated. They get The tale gets taller, but the archetypal significance is what, what is of most interest. So, I, I think maybe God is so difficult because institutional religion have exploited the idea for political ends again and again. And so there's this big legacy of that. But the scriptural teaching, it's this is just, is, you know, we find it, it's not just in religious teachings, you find it in lots of great literature, like children's stories are full of them. So we have these archetypal symbolic human beings. So Krishna does miraculous things, but the miracle, the great miracle of Krishna's life is the loving presence he brings to situations. So if we had more time, we would have spent more time talking about Krishna's life. So we can get more into the understanding of how Krishna, you can see it as a person, but you can also see Krishna in the Mahabharata as a symbolic representation of what a person can aspire to. 
what is possible for a human being who thoroughly commits to love. And this is Krishna. And then Duryodhana, who is the leader of the Kauravas, is the opposite. What happens to a great human being who is thoroughly committed to power and self-advancement? And you can see all the different characters, they can all be like, this is us. What happens if I go more into that tendency within myself? What happens if I let that tendency rise up? So, Krishna is, the way I understand it, I touched on this one of, in one of the sessions, is that in the Indian system, God goes by many names. Many, many, many names. And one of the things about that is it's openly owning. God is not Krishna or Shiva or Vishnu or the Kurmavatara or God is everything. God is that which enables life. Now, there is no word for that. And so we have the word God, we have the word Supreme, or we have the word Ultimate Consciousness, we have the word Krishna or Shiva. Now Krishna and Shiva, one of the things I really appreciate about Krishna and Shiva, and Mother Divine, and Jesus for example, is that these archetypes, they render in a very human form. Because even Shiva, who was like this, there are, the way the stories go, there are, the symbolism is things that I can relate to in the way I use my divine godlike powers. Divine and godlike in the sense that they allow us to create. I can create a particular type of experience by how I use these powers. I can destroy something by how I use these powers. I can maintain something by how I use these powers. I can reveal and clean away a limiting or uh, a limiting belief or blocking idea by how I use these powers. And so I can walk with grace. I can walk in such a way to invite more revelation into my life. So the way I understand it is it's, for me it's very practical, but I understand for, for many people there's so much inherited trauma around certain vocabulary and around a story being used or a symbol or a particular archetype being used as a exploitative manipulative tool perhaps. Um, but for me, I find that the these personified teachings make it more accessible for me anyway. Shall we continue? With into, we'll go more into the poem. <laughs> yeah. So we connect to connectedness. Yeah, as best we can. We orient towards whole system integration. And then 64. Raga dvesha viyuktaha. Now here we have, we've had the word yukta, yeah, I mean connected. Here we've got viyukta. So Krishna says, Raga dvesha viyuktaihi. Those who disconnect from raga and dvesha, who are no longer connected to the craving and the aversion, to seeing things through that tint, in relation to the objects of the senses. So the person, Indriyan Indriyaish Charan, the person who moves freely amongst the sense objects but has disconnected from craving and aversion. Atmavashai, by their own conscious will, with their awareness centered on the conscious essence, on the self, that person, Adigachati, attains, moves towards and experiences. Prasadam. Have you heard of prasadam? Patricia, I guess you had some prasad when you were in India. You've had some prasad, Steve, what? Yes, my past is So, in a ceremony, they'll talk about the prasada is that which has been offered. But what prasada means literally is clear. Yes, that the food that has been blessed has been made to us, something that can clearly carry nourishment to us. 
So here Krishna says, he's 62, 63 has laid out that story of human history, how when we get attached, we can get kind of blind, yeah? From attachment comes desire, comes anger, comes confusion, comes forgetfulness, comes disconnection and being lost. So, we orient towards wholeness and Krishna says, when we can move amongst the objects of the senses, but be disconnected from partiality, basically. So when we can move in a real impartial way, we can enjoy fully, but without taint. We can engage, our conscience is clear. When we engage, but from a strong center, then we attain a clear state. Notice something, we see this a lot, the two aspects of the verse, it's like a mutually complementary system. When I act from a clear center and a clear conscience, I feel more and more clear. Yeah? So I take, be like the tortoise. Check, what is my purpose? What is my motivation? Why am I doing what I'm doing? Is this how I want to proceed? If I proceed from that place, I can move amongst the temptations of life, but do so in a much easier way. Yeah? and in a much clearer way, yeah? Prasade, now he talks further, Prasade, in that clarified state, sarva dukkhanam hanihi asya upajayate. In that clarity, the chetas, which means the consciousness, it is experienced in a clarified state, in a clear, vibrant, bright state, unshrouded, unveiled. And then the buddhi, is very accessible to us. So, prasade, in that clarified state, sadhavadukkanam, of all the types of suffering, there is their hani. Hani means their disappearance, their cessation, their dwindling, their leaving, their going away. Asya, upajayate, it arises. So, in that clear state, there arises the going away of all of those things that would cause that dissonance. Yeah? Prasanna cheta so hyashu buddhif paryavatishtati. When there is that clarity, then the connection to the discernment quickly becomes firm. Is this true? Yeah? And so there's this idea, this applies, this is talking about the ultimate state, but this also applies along the way. Have you noticed how sometimes if you have a visceral experience, it will eradicate a doubt instantly if you really live the experience, yeah? If you think, oh, I can't do that, but then you do it, and you know you did it, it's like, oh, okay, well, yeah, I do it now. It's like, yeah. Now, one more thing about that previous verse about coming to the Prasada state. We'll, 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 we'll come back if we've got time. Is that clear? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 66. Nasti buddhira yuktasya, nacha yuktasya bhavana, nacha bhavayata shantir, ashantasya kutasukam. So we might recognize a few words here. We've got buddhi yuktaha again, and we've got shanta, and we've got bhavana. So we've had all of these words. Remember bhavana? Mm -hmm. It means that the state, the state of being. So Krishna says, a nasty means there is not. So, buddhirayuktasya, so there is no firm connection for the person who is not integrated. Is this true? If we don't feel connected, we don't see clearly. Would you agree? <laughs> if I've left some of myself out, I'm not going to see as clearly as I would be able to. Yeah? Now, thinking to our Indriyaha, these divine powers, where is the power that helps us see? Is it in the eye? No. Where is the power that helps us touch? Is it in the skin? No. So, our energy, where does it come from? Well, big question, who knows? <laughs> but, but our energy, it doesn't 
it's not in the eye or the ear. It's not in the legs that move. Like this morning we were practicing, yeah? May you go in, uh, go in peace and joy. <laughs> Have a lovely time on your adventure. You're going, you're going to Bali? Yeah. Yes. So may you be well, safe, have a wonderful time. Thank you. Thank you, Rita. Take care. <laughs> Bye for now. <laughs> so the power, the energy, it moves through us. It's not in us, it moves through us. Would you agree? Mm -hmm. So what's our task? We want to keep the channels open. Yes? So that's what we were focusing on in these morning sessions. We want to open the gates, remove the blocks, help all the channels get connected. Yeah? So our task is to keep the channels fluid, spacious, open. Ayuk, so that's the first. Ayuktasya buddhi nasti. If we're not connected, we can't be discerning. So our task is get connected, get integrated. How can I become more integrated? So I can use this as an inquiry lens or frame or support as well. Second sentence, ayuktasya nacha bhavana. Now when we're not feeling connected, how is our mood? How is the ground of our being if we're not connected? Because agitated. Like, agitated. There is some agitation. It's not a congruent foundation, yeah? So basically, it's the idea, when we're not balanced, integrated, gathered, collected, then there's no bhavana, there's no underlying mood that is supporting. We don't have the substrate that is supportive, yeah? And when we don't have that appropriate ground, then shanti nasty, then there's no peace. Is this true? Ashantasya kudasakam. How can we have a good vibe feeling? How can we be well if we don't feel peaceful? So, again, looking at the first practically, the invitation. So, Krishna lays it out. There's no samatva, there's no connection, there's no buddhi yuktaha if we're not integrated. So, our job, integrate, connect gather all the parts, include all the parts as best as I can. When, so we turn it around, when I'm integrated, I mean, I feel in the mood for harmony, yes? When I'm in connectedness, I can spread and share that harmony much more easily. I can let that harmony heal parts of myself that may have been neglected much more easily. Would you agree? So it's an invitation. This verse. This is Krishna's teaching style. He doesn't say, Arjuna, integrate. <laughs> you gotta get yourself together, man. No. It's all an invitation. Arjuna hears it. Oh yeah, so it's true. It's true. Yeah, it's true. I, I know this from my own experience. If I'm not integrated, I don't feel like I'm in I'm not in the mood for peace and wellness. Now, if I want to be in the mood for peace or wellness, moods come and go, but is there something I can do about it? Yes, Krishna points out there is. That sustained, patient, kind, steady effort to invite all the parts to come together. So the recipe, invite cohesion. This means to prepare the ground for grace, yeah? If I invite cohesion, one way to invite cohesion is to practice gratitude. If I'm grateful for all the sense powers, even the parts that I sometimes neglect, Maybe, for example, you see something or there's something you want and you feel like whew, this rush of energy. You observe it and you feel thankful that you can feel that thrill. And then it's like you can, you're looking at it with, a kind of, with mirth, yeah, with, some, with good humoredness. It doesn't have the same grip on you. And then you can, you can appreciate it without it sinking its talons into you. Or you feel anger and you notice yourself and you feel Ah. ah, thank you, I have that fire, yes, this, oh, this fire is a great gift, yeah, and then it doesn't grip, grip you, and then it invites grace, it invites, you can transmute the anger, or you can transmute the potentially troubling desire, yeah? And this is the practice to avoid 
misery. Yeah. Not to avoid difficulties or hardships, they will come. But we can still make that steady effort to prepare the ground. Yeah? Now, 67, one of my favorite verses. Indriyana mitsharatam Indriyana mitsharatam Yanmano anuviriyate Yanmano anuviriyate Tarasya harati pragnyam Tarasya harati pragnyam Vayur navam evam basi Vayur navam evam basi So Indriyana a person who's Indriyaha, who's sense and action powers, Charatam, are moving freely, Yanmano, and whose mind, whose internal awareness, Anuvidiyate, follows them. So then it is like Tad Asya, it's like that, that person's awareness, Harati, is carried away. That person's Pragya, discernment. Harati is carried away. Vayur navam iva ambasi. What is nava? You do navasana. Boat. Iva, like a boat on the waters. So, if it's the case that the operating system is functioning under the rule of the whims and fancies of the sense powers as they navigate the world, then it's like we're a ship on the water without a skipper or a pilot. Is this true? What will happen if we're like a, if we just let the senses take over? Okay, senses, you decide. How will our day-to-day -day likely be? Chaotic, yeah? Because remember, these tremendous power tools they function best when they're trained to work like an orchestra. When they're left to play their solo thing, they're deeply, passionately, very responsibly searching for a satisfaction, but they won't be able to find it by themselves. So they'll try hard and lead us down all sorts of blind alleys. Yeah? To lead us into pleasant places, they'll also lead us into the doldrums. So we're like a ship on the water, blow how is the like a ship without a spirit? without a pilot on the ocean. How is the ocean? Like life, yeah? So many currents, so many changes. The wind can do whatever. So, what is this verse telling us? Will we get what we want to get? If we're like a ship without a skipper on the ocean? Not impossible, but most improbable, yeah? So what's the verse telling us? What's the invitation? Krishna's not being didactic about it, he's inviting us to come to our own recognition, masterful pedagogue and psychologist that he is. What's the invitation? Be the skipper. Yes? Be the captain. Now, what does it mean to be the captain? You need to become the master of the vessel. How do you become the master of the vessel? It's like training the horses, yeah? Your ship, it's got all these different sails, it's got all these different rigging. There are systems, there are protocols. Ships have rules. But, a master sailor knows what the rules are for and so does not hesitate to break them to protect the principles and the good functioning of the ship that the rules were intended to help him learn. Does that make sense? So it's the idea. When you learn to sail, there are rules to follow. But sailing, master sailing, they don't follow the rules. It's like you learn the foundations and then you can play and dance with them. But you learn the, like, the rules is like the alphabet. You need to know the alphabet to sing the poetry. But the poetry can go beyond the rules. The sailing can go beyond the rules. So be the skipper. When the storms come, the rule book gets blown overboard. But if you work with the principles skillfully, then you can preempt the storm. You will not be stormed by the storm. Yes? It won't storm, it won't overwhelm you because you'll be prepared. When you're the skipper, how do you need to be? Alert, yeah? People who do sail a lot, like fishermen who, like, they can predict the weather much better than the weather forecasters, yeah? 
happened in the tsunami, yeah? The big Asian tsunami in 2003, 4, whatever it was. Can't remember which year it was, but I was there. Um, so many people didn't know it was coming. All these countries had the advanced meteorological warning signs, they all missed it, but all the indigenous people who were in the area knew. All the indigenous fishermen knew. All the animals knew. So the skipper is paying attention. These are the animal powers, the Indriya. So when we master them, when we respect the vessel, then instead of being like a pilotless boat on the water, we've got a ship that is made to cross the ocean. Yeah? So the invitation, be the skipper. Train yourself to be alert, savvy, and adaptable enough to deal with the unexpected currents of life. Tasmat, there, Tasmat Yasya Mahabahu, Nigrihi Tani Sarvashaha, Indriyan Indriyarte Bihan, Tasya Pragya Vrishtita. So Krishna says, Tasya Pragya Vrishtita, that person's Pragya, intuitive wisdom, is well established. Who? And he calls Arjuna Mahabahu which means a strong arm, you great hero. So he's encouraging him. You, you have this, basically, you have the strength. And he says, Sarvashaha, that person who always and everywhere, Nigrihitani, whose Indriyaha, whose sense powers, are Nigrihitani, in relation to their objects, that person's Pragya is Pratishtita. Is that clear on it? So I, I'm you look like you were trying to like I was. So tasmat yeah, means that tasmat means therefore. Yeah. Yasya, who's Mahabaho? He's addressing him. Nigrihitani. I'm going to talk more about that word in a moment. Sarvashaha means on all sides. Indriyani indriyartebiha means the senses in relation to the sense objects. Tasya pragya prishtita. Tasya, that person's. Pragya, intuitive wisdom, Pratishtita is well established. Now, Nigrihitani, many translations will use words like restrained or checked. But I think that can give a slightly false impression because we've talked about the sense powers are like horses. You don't want to restrain them, you want to harness them. Yes? So I think maybe we could say a person whose Indriya are kept well-balanced, kept in alignment in the sense that they allow energy and information to flow effectively, efficiently, smoothly, whose powers are kept in tune, in good working order, in harmony, in touch with each other, in a mutually supportive state. Like a boat, if all the rigging and tack is in good shape, good working order, well looked after, respectfully tended to, then it can all work together as, is, as and when is needed. Yeah? So, Nigrihitani, many translations. What does your guy say, Judy? Therefore, a mighty armed Arjuna, he who says he's withdrawn from their objects, his intelligence is firmly set. Okay, so he says withdrawn from the objects. But I'm saying not withdrawn from the objects, but I'm saying whose sense powers are so are well looked after. They're well balanced, they're congruent, they're prepared so they can function as a whole in relation to the objects. Then that person becomes firmly established. Now the next verse is quite a famous one and I don't really know what it means. I can make an attempt. It says, Yani shasara bhutanam tasyan jagarti sanyami yasyan jagati bhutani sani shapashyato munehi So ya means basically that which or whose. Now Nisha means night. Sarva Bhutana means of all beings. Tasyam in that, in that, in that dark night, Jag, Jagarti is wakeful, Sanyami. Now Sanyami is somebody in whom there is Sanyama. So Sanyami means a person who has well harnessed all of their powers of awareness, like a sage. So when that in which it is night for all beings or general beings, in that night the Sanyami, 
the yogin, the one who is yukta, the one who is sanyama, the one who has brought all their powers together, <coughs> has all the powers functioning in a cohesive whole, that person is jagarti, that is wakeful. Second line, yasyan jagati bhutani, in that in which the regular beings are wakeful, sanisha pashato muni. When for a sage who is seeing clearly, that is night to that, to that sage. So that in which all regular, that which is night for all beings, in that the sage is wakeful. That in which all beings are awake, or that to which all beings are awake to, that is night to the sage who sees. So what does it mean? One, some, many interpretations. Some people say that which peop, general people are motivated by, the sage isn't interested in. That which people get excited about, the sage doesn't see, sees that as night. Yeah? So the idea, like when we are ordinary people, we want, you know, we depend on the bright lights of, of life. We depend <coughs> on these things to feel wakeful. But a fully established master all of the colors and flavors of the world are as nothing compared to that fullness of the being completely yoked in oneness. So that's one interpretation. And there's another interpretation. Of one of my so if you look at the second line, the last part, Sanisha Pashatu Muni. Now we can take this as Sa Nisha Pashatu. Munihi. But you can also, because of the way Sanskrit works, you can split the words differently. You can also say, Sanisha Apashatu Munihi. And that means a sage who does not see. In which case, the verse could be, that which is night for all beings, in that night, the sage is wakeful. That, which general, that in which general beings are awake, the non-seeing sage, when the sage comes out of their fullness, sees that as night. So he could be saying a real sage, like a wannabe sage, is like, oh, the world's crap. Internal awareness is where it's at. The, but the real master, see, it doesn't matter if he's in the world or out of the world, is wake. It's all full. Does that make sense? But I have a sense that there's many layers of this verse that I haven't managed to connect to yet. But at least we have some, sem some sense of what he's saying. It makes sense in the, in the context of talking about the one who's fully established, that the world doesn't have the same allure for that person as for everybody else. And that which lights up that person isn't really, we're, we're blind to it. We can't even imagine that internal richness. Yeah? And this happens at a more mundane level too. Just a regular meditator. We might enjoy this sweet, nourishing, peaceful internal place. Somebody who's never meditated might think we're sitting there wasting our time closing our eyes. But we know, no, this, this is actually really nourishing for the whole of my life. Yeah? Everybody has their different perspective. Yeah. Definitely. This is another way people often talk about it, is that it's like the external world when I open my eyes and the internal world, like the, the, the day, that which people are awake, and then the night, the ordinary beings, they want the external things. And the Muni, the one who knows silence, in that inner stillness, then the symphony of life is, they're soaking that internally. So that's definitely a nice way of rendering it, Dagmar. It's a little bit of night when you sleep and you lose your sense of ego. Ah, it could be, yeah. So then we'd be saying, that which is night for all beings. Yes, so an ordinary being at night loses the sense of ego but a sage is awake 
in waking, dreaming and sleeping. They say this in yoga. And that in which um, regular beings are awake, the sage who sees, sees that as a night because they're not fully awake even in that. I guess you could say. Does, a, does that, you follow that idea? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. 70th verse is very beautiful. Apuryamanam machara pratishtam samudram apav pravishanti advati tadvat kamayam pravishanti sarvi sashanti mapnoti na kama kami. So Krishna here gives an image of the rivers and the ocean. Apuryamanam, pur means fullness, yeah, purna. Apuryamana means becoming full. Achala pratishtam, achala means not shaking, not moving. And pratishtam established. So samudram is the ocean. Apaha is waters. Pravishanti means to enter into. Yadvat, just as. So just as all waters enter into, flow into the fullness of the ever always full and established fullness of the ocean. Tadvat, similarly, karma, all desires flow into the field of the awareness of the established yogi. And sashantimapnoti, and that person knows and experiences and attains peace. Na karma kami, not the one who is hankering after desires. So the instruction here, be like the ocean. Whether the rivers run dry, or the rivers are in spate and torrenting into the ocean. How is the ocean? The ocean is full. It's always full, is the idea. Whether the rivers are coming or not, the, the ocean is still full. So Krishna says, be like the ocean. The wise one, whether all the things they would ever have liked come flooding towards them, or nothing they want is coming anywhere near them, that person is brimful in and of him or herself. Atmani eva atmana santushta, same idea. But he just gives this image of the ocean. And sashantim atnoti. That way we know peace. When we become our own ocean, when we become the sovereign of our own fullness, then we attain peace. Nakama kami. But not if we're hankering after desires. If we handcraft the desires, it will disturb our peacefulness. But if we can be like the ocean, then as those things come towards us, we can take them, we can experience them without being shaken by them, without being depleted or puffed up, we experience them. Yeah? So the instruction, be oceanic. <laughs> through all the currents, through all the winds and storms and flat times, practice fullness, practice wholeness. Vihaya kamanya sarvan pumans chatimispraha nir mamaha nir ahankaraha sa shantim adhigachati So the first line is all about being free from desire. Vihaya, having given up, abandoned, relinquished, gone beyond. Kaman Saravan, all desires. Puman, the human being, charati, moves in the world free from desire. Nirmamaha, without a sense of I, me, mine. Nirahankara, without a limiting sense of self. Sa shantim adigachati. That person attains real peace. 
So we've got nir mama, nir ahankara, without, beyond, I, me, my. But this does not mean, oh ego, I need to kill you. No. What it means is, oh ego, let me gently expand you into all inclusiveness. So I can move freely in the world without that sense of, I'm only this, I'm only that. When we can move in, in true inclusivity, which is what Krishna demonstrates as the archetype, then I know peace. In Krishna's life, so many tremendous dramas, but he is a repository, he's an ocean of peacefulness. So this idea, abandoning, going beyond, not abandoning, going beyond. It's like they all fade away, all of these hankerings, these desires. But the Puman's charity, the human being is still moving, is still active in the world. But acts without the sense of, oh, and that limiting sense of I need mine. The ahankara still performs its miraculous function of keeping us together as an individual body, dehin, an embodied soul, but sees the world as a field of oneness and interacts with it as that is all of mine. In the native traditions of the, United, of the land that people now call the United States, and also some parts of Central and Southern America, Southern America, many of the indigenous peoples, they have a prayer that says, all my relations, yeah? And there's the idea to remember that all my relations, that's who I need to practice for. That's what it's about, respecting everything, everybody, every being. And so when we can move like that, without that limited sense of, ah, oh, I'm this, I'm, uh, I'm Scottish, I'm not this, or I'm this, I'm not that, or that's mine, that's not mine. When we go beyond that and see everything as one, we connect it to that sense of all my relations, then we know true peacefulness. Yeah, what's the instruction? What's the invitation here? Or the, you know, the instruction that's embedded as an invitation in the verse. What are those things that I get really identified with? What are those things where my identification with I, me, mine is gripping me in a limiting way? What could I do to expand that? What could I do to soften my grip? Just be present, but in a more relaxed way. What are those desires that stop me moving freely. For example, let's recite the last one together. Isha Brahm he stit if parte, Isha Brahm he stit if parte, Nainam Prapya Vimuhyati. Nainam prapya vimuhyati Stitvasya mantakari pi Stitvasya mantakari pi Brahma nirvana mrichati Brahma nirvana mrichati So we mentioned that chapter 2 is considered a kind of distillation of the whole teaching. So here he said, Esha Brahmi Stitihi. So he addresses him as Parta, son of Prita. Again, you who are the child of a woman, you who have come out of your mother's womb, you who are human. He says, Esha Brahmi. So Brahmi means this Shakti, this state. A person who, so this state that he's just described, moving freely in the world, but without a sense of differentiation, seeing the world as oneness, seeing it as my, all my one. When you move in that state of unity, Esha Brahmi Stiti, one who experiences that in a steady way, who really experiences that, Na Enam Prapya Vimuhyati. Once you've really known that oneness, then Na Vimuhyati, you will no longer be confused. So we can experience degrees of oneness, so to speak. But when you experience the Shakti, the Brahmi, it's like feminine active form here. The whole creation as one field of unity, when you really establish it, then you'll never be confused again. 
that experience is so profound, it will dissolve all your limiting ideas. Stitva asyam antakali, having stood in that experience, having inhabited that experience, antakale api, even at the last moment, even at the moment of death, Brahmanirvanam Ritchati, that person will go to Brahmanirvana, which means the state of ultimate freedom, ultimate liberation. So even if you notice that, even not notice, even if you stand in that, you pulsate in that, even at the moment of death, there'll be no going back for you. Because it's it obliterates everything. It dissolves everything. In that true complete Shaktified, when all of your being knows that oneness of the infinite, 